Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Mary Field and Vincent D. Paul de Gabo Lecture on Women's Contributions to Church and Society. As we continue to celebrate our 100th anniversary of Catholic chaplaincy, our speakers are focusing on the questions of faith that will lead us into the next 100 years, including, in this case, images and art that shape our faith. It is my pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, Dr. Nicole Flores, who is Associate Professor of Religious Studies and Director of Health, Ethics, and Society Minor at the University of Virginia. Dr. Flores earned her MDiv at Yale University and a PhD in Theological Ethics from Boston College. Her research in practical ethics addresses issues of politics, migration, labor, family, gender, bioethics, race, and ethnicity, as well as ecology. So pretty much everything when it comes to <laughs> ethics. She's the author of The Aesthetics of Solidarity, Our Lady of Guadalupe, and American Democracy. Following the lecture, there'll be time for students to ask questions, and please just come forward to the mic. Please help me to welcome Dr. Flores as she addresses the topic, Our Lady of Guadalupe and the Art of Solidarity. Welcome. Thank you for your warm welcome, and thank you for uh, being here tonight on uh, a chilly night, although not as chilly as it can be <laughs> here in New Haven, and in the middle of your studying for finals. I really appreciate uh, your uh, uh, willingness to be out here to um, uh, to listen with, uh, to my remarks and to think with me uh, in the Q&A. <clears throat> this evening, I'm eager to discuss Our Lady of Guadalupe, the image of the Virgin Mary that Catholics and many others believe appear to uh, St. Juan Diego on a hill outside of modern-day Mexico City in 1531. Guadalupe is everywhere. Although Guadalupan devotion originates in Mexico City, her story and symbol has migrated far beyond. Guadalupe has gone global, her symbol taking root from Tucson to Paris, from Denver to Rome, from Delano to New Haven. Given her global significance, Guadalupe's image is often appropriated to support a broad range of causes, including causes that often come into conflict with one another. For example, while her image has been crucial to farm workers in the United States organizing for economic and human rights, it has also been leveraged by Banamex, the second largest bank in Mexico, in support of its business. In the United States today, Guadalupe's image has been seen at the March for Life, even as it is leveraged as an image of feminist empowerment. So you can see some of these images here, the farm workers marching behind the banner of Guadalupe, uh, a, an image from the March for Life featuring Our Lady of Guadalupe. And this is a, a placard at uh, the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico City uh, uh, declaring Banamex's sponsorship for a, um, uh, one of the displays at uh, the Basilica. Considering these diverse appropriations of her symbol, what does Guadalupe mean for us today? How ought we make sense of Guadalupe's place in our common life, our culture, our economics, our politics? In short, what are the interpretive politics for the symbol that has been so significant in the lives of Catholics across the globe? To address these questions, today I would like to lay out for you what I call a political theology of Guadalupe, or a theological and aesthetic framework for interpreting Guadalupe's meaning and its significance for our 21st century democracy, specifically within the United States, but also beyond. First, some background on Our Lady of Guadalupe and her appearance to Juan Diego. The encounter between the Virgin of Guadalupe and Juan Diego is said to have taken place in 1531, though the earliest known written account was recorded more than a century later in 1648. Juan Diego, as the story goes, is drawn to the hill of Tepeyac, which he calls the place of flowers, or heaven in Nahuatl. 
Juan Diego finds Guadalupe on Tepeyac. Guadalupe asks Juan Diego to petition Bishop Juan de Sumaraga to build a basilica in her honor there. Juan Diego initially demurs, feeling unworthy to petition the bishop due to his marginal status in colonial society. Nevertheless, Guadalupe persists, convincing Juan Diego that it is he, not a person of higher social status, nor one with more influence, who she wants to appear before the bishop on her behalf. Juan Diego, after unsuccessful attempts to persuade the bishop to build Guadalupe's basilica, appears before him a final time. This time, Guadalupe sends Juan Diego with a tilma, or his cloak, full of roses, grown in the frozen December earth. When Juan Diego unfurls his lap fold to present the flowers to the bishop as a sign of the veracity of Guadalupe's message, a brilliant image of the Virgin of Guadalupe appears embedded in the garment. Converted by the splendid image, Zumaraga believes Juan Diego's story and grants his request to build a basilica dedicated to Guadalupe. And as you all know, as uh, members of uh, St. Thomas More Church, there's a beautiful rendering of the story, uh, artistic rendering, in, uh, uh, in the sanctuary uh, that relates these details um, through uh, the painting. Political theology is particularly amenable to investigating the multivalent significance of Guadalupe's symbol, which is simultaneously Catholic and indigenous, personal and universal, ethical and political. I argue that a political theology of Guadalupe ought to be anchored in her relationship with Juan Diego as a, quote, humble commoner, a poor, ordinary person whom she selected to advocate for her before the colonial ecclesial or church authorities. The encounter between Guadalupe and Juan Diego articulates a relational ethics in which Juan Diego is empowered by his encounter with Guadalupe's beauty, or what is known as flower and song in Nahuatl, to recognize his dignity and personhood, which are constituted by the ethical norms of autonomy and relationality, I will argue. Beyond his personal experience of conversion, the aesthetic encounter with Guadalupe participates in Juan Diego's empowerment and change in status vis-a-vis -vis colonial ecclesial power structures. In light of Juan Diego's experience of empowerment, I anchor this political theology of Guadalupe and Juan Diego in the Magnificat, showing how this relationship participates in bringing down the powerful from their thrones and lifting up the lowly. First, a bit more on Guadalupean interpretation. A recurring question in Guadalupean theological interpretation is whether the symbol is essentially one of private devotion, directing the de devotee toward Jesus as the Son of God, born of the Virgin Mary, or one of larger political and cultural signific significance, exerting power within various public realms. The question itself assumes a dichotomous view of the relationship between religion and public life that is characteristic of modernity. It is the same dichotomous worldview that enforces a strict separation between the domestic and the public spheres, relegating religious devotion to the private and domestic. This is particularly prevalent in feminized <clears throat> feminized aspects of religious and theological traditions, including Catholic Marian devotion. Devotion to Mary as mother of God, including Our Lady of Guadalupe, is understood as a private matter carried out in a domestic context. But recent social scientific studies, especially in the sociology of religions and through the use of ethnographic research methods has demonstrated the inextricably public and political dimensions of personal and ecclesial Marian devotions. The feminist axiom, the personal is political, helps illustrate the inherently public dimensions of Marian devotion. 
Jeanette Rodriguez finds that Guadalupe has strong personal significance for Mexican American women. In interviews uh, <clears throat> with these women, uh, they describe Gu Guadalupe as a reflection of both their faith in God and their Mexican American identity. The women who participated in Rodriguez's study are not involved in political activism, even in Mexican American social justice organizations that were prominent at the time that Rodriguez conducted her study. Rodriguez avers that this kind of activity might not be encouraged or supported among the young mothers with whom she spoke. Even so, the study participants described how Guadalupe helps them to respond to struggles in their social world, especially those that they experience as mothers. <clears throat> Consider what happened to Mary, Rodriguez explains. Her son was crucified, suffered, and died, but he rose from the dead. Therefore, things will be well, despite the torment, pain, alienation, loneliness, confusion, and suffering. Guadalupe understands the pain they experience as mothers who are marginalized in society due to their ethnicity, race, culture, and gender. It is in this identification that Guadalupe's political significance becomes evident. The image of Our Lady of Guadalupe is a symbol of power for a population in a seemingly powerless situation, argues Rodriguez. Guadalupe is a symbol of empowerment that helps women to survive amid difficult political circumstances. If the personal is political, then the empowerment of Mexican-American women in the context of their everyday lives is already an act of political resistance to social, economic, and political structures that undermine their dignity. Maria del Socorro Castaneda uh, also has a study on the views of Guadalupe among Mexican women living in the United States, and her study yields similar findings. When she asks Esperanza, one of the participants in her study, whether Guadalupe is a Mexican cultural symbol or a Catholic religious symbol, Esperanza's response grapples productively with Guadalupe's multivalent significance. Castaneda writes, in a firm but endearing tone, Esperanza asked me, could you please do me a favor and remove the milk from the coffee you are drinking. I looked at her and told her that what she asked was me to do was impossible, for the coffee and milk were mixed. Then she proceeded to say, exactly, mija. Mexico is like coffee and milk. You cannot separate the Virgin of Guadalupe from religion and culture. It is all mixed. Esperanza gives an apt illustration of Guadalupe's manifestation in both religion and culture. While it can be helpful, perhaps, to make analytical distinctions between religion and culture for the sake of conceptual clarity, the lived expression of religion and culture is mutually constitutive. Guadalupe is simultaneously sacred and secular, religious and cultural, personal and political. Esperanza's insight, her theological insight, also gestures to Guadalupe's multidimensional meaning in the context of 21st century democracy. Guadalupe's formative religious and cultural influence is not something that Mexican Americans simply abandon when they interact with matters of public significance. While Castaneda's study par participants describe Guadalupe's personal and religious significance in their lives, their responses to the author's questions are inflected by their social, political, and economic context. Whereas Rodriguez and Castaneda emphasize Guadalupe's personal significance for Mexican and Mexican-American women, Sociologist Alicia Galvez links Guadalupan devotional practices that are carried out in the context of parishes and private homes with direct political action for immigration justice. Galvez investigates the work of parish-based Comites Guadalupanos in New York City that are united at the di 
the level of the diocese in the Tepeyac Association. So these are Guadalupe committees uh, at particular parishes that, um, that cooperate and correspond with one another uh, within New York City. Um, Galvez reports that these parish-based committees help preserve domestic devotional practices, such as the display of Guadalupe's image in homes and in church sanctuaries, and the maintenance of parish Guadalupe shrines. The committees, however, engage in public piety of Guadalupe that has inherent political dimensions. For example, they organize an annual public procession in conjunction with Guadalupe's feast day on December 12th, making it an act of both religious devotion and political protest. And we see that in this image here. This is at uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City in Midtown. Um, <clears throat> the procession is rich with religious ritual, but also serves as an, exp it also serves an, explicit political purpose as a protest for immigration justice. Galvez describes the participants in the event as both pilgrims and protesters. They kiss images of the Virgin, carry costumes associated with the story of the Virgin's apparition, and they also carry signs asking for immigration reform, chanting, si se puede, yes we can, just like protesters do at marches, and display both Mexican and US flags. Additionally, the association, uh, sorry, the Tepeyac Association organizes the Guadalupe torch run, during which a flame is carried by relay runners from the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico City to St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City, arriving at the cathedral during uh, the feast day procession. And I should note here um, that this procession hasn't, uh, it, it's kind of fallen out of practice. Um, so this is uh, now, uh, well, well, when Galvez wrote, it was um, a very current uh, of events. It is now um, uh, something that exists in our memories. And who knows, maybe it will come back someday. Um, such acts of devotion aim to raise public awareness about the Guadalupanos' struggle for full citizenship rights. For example, although the binational relay was a religious pilgrimage, it, was, uh, it also possessed a politically transgressive quality serving as a public demonstration against the separation of families and communities by unjust immigration policies. Guadalupan devotional practices thus entered the public square, articulating rights claims in the idiom of US Latinx popular religious devotion. Galvez's findings make explicit all that is implied by Rodriguez and Castaneda's studies of the personal significance of Guadalupe for her Mexican and Mexican-American devotees. That Guadalupe is inherently personal and political and influences interactions with the public square in both explicit and implicit ways. The multivalent expression of public piety <clears throat> is crucial to both religious and devotional practices. A political theology of Guadalupe should strive to explicate Guadalupe's political significance for a democracy in the 21st century as it is reflected in these ethnographic studies. Toward offering a framework for interpretation, I will now turn to the ethical and political dimensions of Guadalupe's narrative, particularly her relationship with Juan Diego. While this relationship is often excised in artistic representations of Guadalupe's symbol, it is, I will argue, essential to understanding the meaning of, of this symbol and narrative and their significance in a democratic society. What is the political significance of Guadalupe for US Latinx communities engaged in liberative political projects within the context of a 21st century US democracy? Roberto Goizueta addresses this question in his 1999 classic text, Caminemos con Jesús. In this work, Goizueta provides a theological framework for interpreting the relationship between Guadalupe and Juan Diego. 
His theological interpretation of their encounter gestures to its ethical dimensions by demonstrating how Guadalupe empowered Juan Diego to recognize his own personhood in a society that attempted to deny his inherent dignity. Margaret Farley, I just have all of the Yale hits tonight, Roberto Guesueta, Margaret Farley. Uh, Margaret Farley argues that there are two obligating ethical features of personhood, autonomy and relationality. To treat a human as an end is to respect her autonomous capacity to set her own agenda, rather than to treat her as a mere means to an end by absorbing her into one's own agenda. While human beings have the capacity for self-governance, we are also related to others in intrinsic ways. These relationships are essential to the formation of our identities, necessitating treatment of those with whom we are in relationship, not merely as means for accomplishing our own goals, but as ends in themselves and to whom we are responsible. As Farley writes, Another way to say all of this is that as persons, we are terminal centers, ends in ourselves, because in some way, we both transcend ourselves and yet belong to ourselves. Farley's account of personhood illuminates the relational dynamics between Guadalupe and Juan Diego that Goizueta highlights in his exegesis of their encounter. While Guadalupe sees Juan Diego as uniquely capable of conveying her, me her message to Bishop Zumarraga, Juan Diego doubts his own capacity to do so, to be heard by those in power. When his first appeal to Zumar Zumarraga does not yield a positive outcome, Juan Diego asks Guadalupe to call upon someone with more power to advocate on her behalf. I greatly implore you, my patron, noble lady, my daughter, to entrust one of the high nobles who are recognized, respected, and honored to carry and take your message so that he will be believed. For I am a poor ordinary man. I am one of the common people, one who is governed. And that's from uh, one of the four uh, uh, translations, uh, or sorry, one of the four original accounts of uh, the Guadalupe and Juan Diego encounter, and it's specifically from um, the one that was written in Nahuatl uh, significantly. Uh, Juan Diego's self-designation as one who is governed is a particularly striking statement when read in light of Farley's articulation of the essential ethical features of, per of personhood. Society does not view him as having the capacity to govern his own life, and he does not view himself as having that capacity either. Guadalupe's request, he believes, is of such great importance that she should entrust it to a powerful person capable of exercising agency in relation to the ecclesial authorities of the time. Juan Diego's request to send a powerful person to Zumarraga, along with his denial of his own agency, suggests that he does not regard himself as a political actor capable of confronting the colonial authorities. And why would he? He was the lowliest of the low in colonial society. As Guisueta notes, it is at this moment in the narrative that Guadalupe recognizes and affirms Juan Diego's dignity and agency. In contrast to his own reluctance, Guisueta writes, La Morenita refuses to accept his deprecatory self-understanding and instead calls him the dearest of my children, someone capable of acting. Whereas Juan Diego misunderstands himself as an object or tool whose sole value comes from its usefulness, Guadalupe sees affirmation of his full personhood as a necessary aspect of her message. Beyond a mere utilitarian view of Juan Diego as a means for the end of having a basilica built on Tepeyac, Juan Diego's dignity and power are the very content of her message. The content of her message. She insists that it is necessary for Juan Diego himself to advocate to the bishop on her behalf. 
Do listen, my youngest child, she says. Be assured that my servants and messengers to whom I entrust it to carry my message and realize my wishes are not high-ranking people. Rather, it is highly necessary that you yourself be involved and take care of it. It is very much by your hand that my will and wish are to be carried out and accomplished. Guadalupe chooses Juan Diego to be her advocate, not in spite of his lowliness, but because of it. Guadalupe's message thus invokes the text of the Magnificat attributed to Mary of Nazareth. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. Lifted up by Guadalupe, Juan Diego becomes aware of his own dignity through the acts of discerning goodness through beauty and in revealing truth to power. Goisueta further observes that Guadalupe treats Juan Diego as her equal in the context of their relationship. Guadalupe does not simply appear to a passive Juan Diego speaking soothing words and giving him orders that she compels him to obey. She asks him questions. She heeds his responses. She argues with him. She gives him reasons for why she wants him to do what she wants him to do. This dynamic alone would have been remarkable and radical even uh, in terms of the relational experiences that an indigenous person would have had in colonial Mexico. Their encounter transforms Juan Diego's self-understanding from passive object to active subject. Guadalupe reveals to Juan Diego and to the colonial powers his humanity, dignity, and agency. Juan Diego now recognizes himself not as an instrument of society, of the economy, or of the empire, but as an advocate on behalf of, of Guadalupe and the people whom she adopts as her own. In this way, Juan Diego is fundamentally transformed by his encounter with Guadalupe. Goizueta's interpretation of the relationship between Guadalupe and Juan Diego helps us to formulate this political theology of their encounter, one that is crucial to how we interpret the symbol and the story in the 21st century. Though it is not a story strictly about personal conversion or conversion of a people, <clears throat> although this is certainly a vital and indispensable dimension of the story, um, Sorry, this is not a story strictly about personal uh, conversion. Rather, it is a story <clears throat> of political empowerment of the oppressed within the context of colonization. The encounter made evident Juan Diego's capacity for self-governance, an autonomy that is essential for liberty, as well as his fundamental dignity, which is the foundation to claims of human equality. This empowerment was central to cultivating his agency to confront the, the colonial ecclesial powers. In this way, the story is relevant in a US democratic context where the oppressed and marginalized resist the legacies of colonization, slavery, and segregation that still fester in our common life. The ethical dimensions of their relationship are essential for understanding the event's political significance. The Guadalupe symbol can be and has been manipulated to support myriad ends, foregrounding the relational encounter between Guadalupe and Juan Diego highlights the symbol's potential to assert a vision of personhood that is amenable to the project of democracy, including the values of participation, equality, and mutuality that are essential to a thriving democratic life. Interpreted within the US political context, Guadalupe is a symbol of solidarity, one that invites the formation of a democratic community committed to a vision of justice that requires the flourishing of every member of society. And just a couple more remarks, and then there will be time for questions. A mural controversy. The dynamics of the political theology of Guadalupe and Juan Diego are captured in a mural of the two painted behind the Eucharistic altar of Our Lady of Guadalupe Parish in Denver, Colorado. 
1976, Father Jose Lara invited a parishioner at the church to paint a mural of the Virgin of Guadalupe and to depict her as, quote, a beautiful Chicana or Mexican-American woman from North Denver. The mural featured an image of Guadalupe's encounter with Juan Diego on Tepeyac. For decades, the mural was the backdrop for the parish's Eucharistic celebrations, as well as its enactment of its robust social justice mission. The church was a symbol of a fight for equality, and the mural was his emblem, said one of the parishioners. In 2010, Our Lady of Guadalupe's new pastor ordered a white wall to be built in front of the mural arguing that the image of Guadalupe and Juan Diego detracts from the adoration of the Eucharist. I found some rich irony as I was preparing <laughs> this, uh, these remarks that I was um, kneeling before the image of Guadalupe behind <laughs> uh, the, the Eucharist uh, after Mass today <laughs> in, um, in the sanctuary here. Um, <clears throat> so the decision to do this was made out of concern for the catechesis of the people of Our Lady of Guadalupe Parish. And the decision was upheld by the um, Archdiocese of Den Denver, which was then under the leadership of uh, Archbishop Charles Chaput. Monsignor Jorge de los Santos, the vicar of Hispanic ministry of the Archdiocese in 2010, defended the decision to cover the mural, claiming, the religion does not reside in the culture, but in the faith. Many parishioners mourn the loss of the mural, citing, <clears throat> citing it, its importance to Denver's Chicano Catholic community. The mural stood for over 30 years as an inspiring source of devotion, pride, and faith for thousands of parishioners, visitors from across the globe, and the Latinx community, which has struggled for decades for true acceptance and respect by the institutional church in Denver. In response, the archdiocese criticized the parish's efforts to draw public attention to the issue. A salient political theological point has been overlooked in this conflict concerning the mural. The decision to cover the mural with the white wall was both a theological and a political decision. It was an assertion of doctrinal orthodoxy, but also an exercise of ecclesial power. Theologically, the move suggested that the Eucharist is an act of communion with Christ, but not with those with whom Christ is in relationship. It asserts a flattened Eucharistic theological anthropology that is unable to simultaneously assert Jesus' radical singularity while also acknowledging the centrality of both synchronic and diachronic relationships in the work of salvation. Politically, the decision to cover the mural served as an affront to the parish's work in Denver's Chicano social justice movement, in which it led calls for social justice during turbulent social times in the mid-20th century. The Archdiocese of Denver reiterates <clears throat> the pattern of Bishop Zumar Zumaraga's distrust of Juan Diego's advocacy on behalf of Guadalupe. Covering the mural, and thus hiding Juan Diego, he, the mural's now uh, behind this wall that you see there. It's literally in a broom closet. Uh, so they, they call her Our Lady of the Broom Closet, now at Our Lady of Guadalupe Parish, which is both funny but also um, deeply tragic. Um, <clears throat> uh, so covering this mural and hiding Guadalupe, uh, excuse me, hiding Guadalupe and Juan Diego asserts an implicit political theology of Our Lady of Guadalupe. It renders the symbol one of colonial triumph and reinforces a narrative of the conversion of indigenous people to the Catholic Church without demanding a fund fundamental shift in either civic or ecclesial power dynamics in return. This Guadalupe is easily leveraged for unjust purposes. The political theology of Guadalupe and Juan Diego that I have presented here demands an invocation of Guadalupe in the realm of politics that accounts for the presence of the oppressed, especially the colonized. 
Juan Diego's presence undermines appropriation of, Guadalupe, uh, of the Guadalupe narrative as a means of asserting calls for diversity and reconciliation without an associated call for justice. While a political theology of Guadalupe helps us to see the importance of Guadalupe in the calls for justice among Latinx communities, it also gestures to Guadalupe's substantive justice meaning for the life of democracy in our time. By highlighting Juan Diego's transformative moral and political experience on Tepeyac, the relationship between Guadalupe and Juan Diego acknowledges the narrative's essential connection to rectification of power imbalances in both ecclesial and political structures. It situates anyone who has encountered oppression in any dimension as Guadalupe's beloved child, whom she empowers to recognize and embrace their full multidimensional personhood within their work for justice. From Denver to Charlottesville to New Haven, a political theology of Guadalupe and Juan Diego places her on the side of those who have been subject to unjust legacies of conquest, colonization, slavery, segregation, racism, sexual violence, and deportation. It is a political theology of Magnificat, where Mary's soul is magnified as she bears witness to God's promise to lift up the lowly. A political theology of this sort informs a vision of just solidarity within the context of a pluralistic and democratic society. The relationship between Guadalupe and Juan Diego illustrates the centrality of solidarity for the life of, the demo uh, of democracy in our society. This kind of solidarity is predicated on an account of personhood that features autonomy, relationship, aesthetics, and transcendence. More concretely, this view of solidarity bridges the narrative of, of Guadalupe's encounter with Juan Diego from the realm of poetry to the realm of politics and demands a conception of solidarity that grapples with the reality of social conflict. To be sure, Guadalupe's symbol has often been turned into an icon for a form of solidarity that celebrates difference without interrogating power differentials that hinder the pursuit of justice. But a political theology of Guadalupe and Juan Diego resists assimil assimilative appropriation by highlighting the conflictual aspects of the account. Interpreted in the midst of conflict, the story reminds us who has power, who has been denied power, and what is being done to rectify power imbalances. The account testifies to the necessity of lifting up the lowly and bringing down the powerful from their thrones in the context of 21st century democracy, in the pursuit of a pervasive social justice that seeks the good of all society's members within a pluralistic society. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Flores, for going through the, both the story of Guadalupe and also how this gets played out in parish life, because I think that's what most of us will be living in in different aspects and how do we um, engage symbols of faith and yes. work with that. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious from, you talked about the St. Patrick's procession is no longer really happening, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if some of that is that a generational thing that you see happening mm. in terms of either less devotion towards Mary or less public protest? Mm. Or are there different ways that those things are coming about? Or how do people reclaim that sense of Guadalupe and own it as their own symbol today as we're seeing other protests happen in different realms? Yes, yes. That is an excellent question, in part because you've identified uh, this generational challenge. It's not simply that, you know, uh, folks who are, you know, who love to uh, participate in street processions are, you know, getting older and young people are not interested in street processions. It's that I would argue our digital lives have reoriented how we do this kind of work for justice. Um, so I am, as you can tell, pro uh, street uh, devotional procession and protest <laughs> as well. And, you know, um, at least in my context in Charlottesville, Virginia, we, tr we actively work to maintain those uh, traditions. We have people kind of, uh, you know, prompting us to, to, you know, get back, you know, out into the streets, 
as an act of faith. Um, uh, Jelaine Schmidt, for example, who's a colleague of mine at the University of Virginia who studies um, Caridad del Cobre, uh, who's uh, the special virgin of uh, uh, Cuba, uh, she, uh, she's also articulated uh, arguments for uh, the fact that the, um, not just the Catholic faith, but um, devotion to Mary actually calls us into the streets in very political ways. But I do think the, the challenging edge of your question is, uh, it, it might be, how do we continue to uh, have this kind of engagement, both as an assertion and articulation of justice, but also to receive that when uh, our digital media and our social media in particular seems to amp up our differences rather than give us a chance to think about how we're related to each other in a really integral way. Um, so I, I suppose that's why I hope uh, that uh, processions like these, which exist they, not just in New York City, but I think the one at St. Patrick's was really unique in part because of its location but also because of this binational torch relay, which is, uh, I didn't have time to show the video, but it's really cool. You can Google it, um, uh, and it shows just how uh, immersive this experience was for those who participated in it, but also uh, what a witness it was for uh, those who, who saw it. Um, so uh, I would hope and pray that <laughs> that kind of event uh, uh, finds its way back into <laughs> uh, the devotional lives of um, of uh, people who love Guadalupe. Other questions? Yes. Oh. <laughs> and to have the Dean of the Divinity School, uh, when I was a student there, ask me a question is like the, uh, the stuff of nightmares. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> totally friendly questions. Uh, thank you for a really interesting paper. Uh, two questions, one yeah. historical and one comparative. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you uh, uh, called uh, to our attention the, the Magnificat mm -hmm. uh, with its um, uh, wonderful um, revolutionary kind of flavor, right? Yes. And, uh, and throwing down the, uh, the mighty from their thrones and uh, uh, lifting up the lowly. Uh, was that cited or used in the original context of the uh, apparition? Mm. Was that part of the, the dialogue between oh, that... uh, the bishop and... Uh... It is not. So uh -huh. a part of that, you know, is my, you know, theological interpretation and, tr and drawing the connection, but also, you know, reading the story of Guadalupe as a part of, you know, larger right, right, right. Marian devotion that, that would connect mm -hmm. it. But um, as far as I know, in the two accounts that I'm most familiar with, it is not directly referenced there. It'd be interesting to, to know if it was somehow in the background there and yes. was inspiring yeah. some of the... Th uh, this. Um, the other is, uh, you know, there were major uh, Marian apparitions in the 19th and 20th century mm -hmm. at Lourdes and at uh, Fatima. Mm -hmm. uh, have you uh, explored those and explored the way in which uh, they might involve both um, political and cultural as well as religious elements? Uh, I personally have not, primarily because this was, you know, my... Uh, uh, connection uh, as a you know to the the, Lat uh, the Latino theological community, but I do think that um, in terms of uh, expanding uh, the the research and thinking about how a political theology of these experiences is constructed, this is extremely relevant. Um, in part because um, and th this this is kind of implied in what I've said here, but not really you know I only have <laughs> you know just, uh, so much time, but. Um, uh, the political appropriations, not just of uh, uh, Fatima or Lourdes, but also Guadalupe, have um, uh, occurred within uh, nationalist uh, mm -hmm. contexts, and uh, that is very complicated. And uh, especially for de for demo the life of democracy right now, how these uh, these symbols and really all Christian symbols are being appropriated uh, with, within uh, movements that actually seek to um, uh, root out difference and to uh, shore up um, a specific kind of, not just religious, but uh, uh, potentially uh, national and even racial identity. So I think there's 
there's a lot of work to be done, but as you know, the sources are <laughs> uh, uh, Yeah, I think prima facie, it seems more likely that there's a lot of this going on in the 16th century, given the, uh, the people who were involved, yes, than yes. there might be in, um, in the 19th or 20th century apparitions. One more little question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the image um, of Guadalupe, uh, is of um, uh, the woman clothed with the sun and mm -hmm. uh, with the moon and 12 stars under her feet and all of that, mm -hmm. which of course comes from the book of Revelation, right? Chapter mm -hmm. 12. Yes. Um, uh, an image that's uh, appropriated in all sorts of places, like um, uh, the central building at the University of Notre Dame or yes, the, yes. Uh, the cathedral in, uh, in Los Angeles uh, and many other places. Uh, but it is coming from a book that's laden with political and uh, mm. social dimensions. Yes. And I'm wondering if that um, might be relevant to my first question of whether mm. there's uh, some evocation of the Magnificat and all of the juicy stuff that goes on in there <laughs> in just the way the image is presented. Yes, I well certainly the the connections are there uh, with the image, but um, I, I think both in terms of uh, both the explicit and implicit uh, um, uh, uh, text of the uh, of of the story there uh, that is relevant, but also you know for my purposes as you know um, a political theologian, I think that. You know, I'm getting a lot of ideas here. Revelations is <laughs> certainly uh, has not been uh, a part of my thinking, but it sounds like uh, it probably should be. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. <laughs> Other questions? Hi, I have a related image, uh, a related question to the image itself. Yes. I wonder if you could talk some about. Um, what about this image in particular, besides its miraculous mm. background, um, makes it so mm. personally compelling to people in mm. their prayer lives? Yeah. Um, maybe some of the iconographic elements or mm -hmm. anything else. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very interesting because I think I'll answer this question uh, first and foremost as you know, a Mexican American woman. For me and for my mother and for her mother, uh, the fact of uh, the image's brown skin um, is a very powerful connection. Uh, and of course, uh, the, uh, what this sig signals uh, in colonial Mexico is that her image is neither uh, fully Spanish nor fully indigenous, but both. And uh, thus, be, you know, speaking of you know national identity in the uh, in the role of um, Marian images in um, in uh, shaping national identities, like this is a crucial image for the shaping of Mexican national identity. And as someone who you know, uh, I'm I'm from the Western United States, so I you know uh, grew up in a um, uh, you know uh, a context where we you know we're living in both cultural but also physical borderlands and uh, areas that had uh, experienced uh, uh, colonization, having that connection, I think, is what really, that, that connection to homeland really resonates deeply, um, both with uh, the, the women in the, the studies that I cite, but also, you know, I can speak from personal experience that, um, uh, and as a Mexican, that um, uh, that is uh, extremely important to uh, the perception. But the interesting thing about Guadalupe is that she's not just important to Mexicans. Like, there are so many, uh, 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 local virgins who are very, very important to their specific people. And for some reason, Guadalupe, uh, as Judith Dupre uh, uh, writes, has gone global. She is, you know, she just appeals to everyone. And I wonder if um, uh, some of that is um, related to her story, but you know, other aspects of her icon. But I also feel limited by my perspective as someone who feels very connected to specific aspects of her image. So I might even just turn the question back around to all of you. Like if you're not Mexican, why do you love her so much? Because so many people adore her. And I think in part because she, um, the, the, um, the warmth and the beauty of this image 
brings people peace and a sense of belonging, a sense of welcome. Uh, but I <laughs> uh, um, am not exactly sure how that how that works for non Mexicans. <laughs> um, other questions <laughs> or comments, <laughs> responses to my question. <laughs> Yes, sir. Um, yes, thank you. Um, uh, we mentioned how um, Guadalupe is adored uh, by Mexican women, <laughs> Mexican American women. Um, and we also um, um, talked about you, you, the difference between, you know, Mexican, um, this Mexican feeling, let's call it, mm -hmm. towards her adoration mm -hmm. uh, and non-Mexican. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question on men in Mexico, mm -hmm. men, uh, whether in Mexico or Mexican-Americans who are here in, in the United States, what is their relationship, mm -hmm. uh, what, how, um, you know, how, how do they feel about, uh, mm -hmm. about uh, Guadalupe? That is a wonderful question. And yeah. I imagine uh, some uh, ethnographers' ears are ringing out there because uh, what an incredible set of studies that could be um, uh, in, in the same uh, key. The, the, the primary body of work that exists right now has, a, as, um, uh, as you noted, has been uh, done with women. But the image of Guadalupe exerts a really important uh, uh, function for uh, uh, the identities of Mexican men, um, but also for Mexican masculinity uh, in important ways. And I think uh, some of that is um, uh, associated with the loving connection to the image. Like, for example, so this is um, uh, Archbishop uh, Samuel uh, Aquila, of, uh, who, who now heads the, the Archdiocese of Denver. But I've noticed not just Aquila, but bishops around the United States really are drawn to her image. And I, I think a part of that is uh, a, a maternal draw, a draw to that protection as well. But there's also a way that her image is um, asserted and, uh, and maybe even in some cases protected uh, uh, as a part of a, um, uh, a broader campaign of uh, protecting uh, identity, whether that's Mexican identity or Catholic identity. Uh, you know, her, um, her image of protectress, I think, uh, is sometimes also turned into a protected image <laughs> uh, uh, kind of uh, status. So uh, for example, uh, uh, when I write articles, you know, in uh, public f fora about Our Lady of Guadalupe, um, I often get comments uh, that are very, uh, uh, perhaps needlessly defensive <laughs> of Guadalupe from uh, from uh, from Latino men, uh, saying, you know, how dare you, you know, say that, <laughs> you know, she. Uh, um, uh, you know, she's a feminist symbol, you know, that's not what she is and that's not who she is. So um, again, you know, I don't want to speak too far out of turn because I think that there's an incredible study <laughs> that, that can be done to, to that effect. But um, uh, there, there is an important way that um, connection to the Virgin uh, is important uh, as I see the dynamics of devotion to her today in uh, shaping uh, not just uh, Mexican or Latino uh, uh, ma masculine identity, but uh, Catholic male identity. So again, any, any men in the room who want to uh, speak to how Guadalupe helps you to uh, uh, understand your own identity as Catholic, I would be really excited to hear more about that. Thank you for your excellent question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi there. Hi. Um, so I have a question about um, what happens next, right? So like mm. St. Juan Diego, you know, once he, he's, he's told that he's worthy and that this is his mission, yes. mm -hmm. like he's told to go on and like build a shrine, yes. right? I wonder yes. how that like 
that as like the specific mission mm. of, uh, of uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe, how that has replicated itself in all these movements you mentioned. Yes, like, is, yes. are, is there like a shrine building portion to like, mm -hmm. like how does that fit into the larger story yes. what you're supposed to do with this? Yeah, um, so uh, the um, Tepeyac Association and the Guadalupe com committees, what, what's fascinating about them to me is that they all kind of uh, get their start from parish-based practices of caring for the images of Guadalupe, for you know, you know, building a home for her, uh, so to speak. So they will you know take the image from their particular parish to different homes, uh, for example. Um, or uh, you know, speaking of men and Guadalupe, you know, there uh, 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 Alicia Galvez tells a story of uh, of a man who is a member of one of the parishes who would show up every morning to clean up in front of the shrine, right? Uh, that there were these important functions of, um, uh, of care and carrying out her mission. And what's fascinating is that, you know, this, this work of, uh, as, as specifically as it relates to the pursuit of immigrant justice also seems to be about place building uh, and about, you know, uh, uh, taking care of Guadalupe's home and responding to her call, uh, even you know, somewhat reluctantly, <laughs> uh, to uh, to do uh, to pursue justice in ways that that are truly risky and call you know call a lot, especially from uh, uh, people who uh, are not officially documented in the United States to get publicly involved with these movements. You know that that can come at uh, great personal. Um, uh, cost or, you know, for, uh, for parishes and, and churches who've been involved with the sanctuary movement that can come with, uh, potentially, you know, uh, some, uh, complicated political, uh, you know, uh, implications. I, I, uh, I'm actually not, uh, if there's any law students in the room, perhaps you can explain to us the, <laughs> the legality behind the sanctuary uh, uh, movement and how that applies to churches or doesn't. Um, but, um, but yes, uh, so to, to re return to, to your question, I think that um, uh, both in the personal practices, uh, that what happens next is very important in terms of devotion, but I think that also that next step influences how her... Um, her image and um, and the life of devotion associated with Guadalupe and Juan Diego is is engaged. So we're all just a bunch of you know little Juan Diegos. <laughs> just as a last question here. So Guadalupe engages and invites us into the protest and into that mm -hmm. movement. Do you see the same kind of relationship with Jesus in these same parishes where there's a mm -hmm. high Guadalupe devotion? Or does it stay more with Guadalupe? Or um, are those kind of two different conversations? Yeah, um, I think um, because I think about ethics, uh, politics, and aesthetics, in my mind they are um, uh, deeply connected. And I think that um, these justice movements are often making decisions not based on like, you know, a, you know, theological treaties like, oh, we're going to go read, you know, Flores' book and then sit down and think about what our image is. I think that these images um, uh, come to prominence within their particular movements based on uh, the perceived needs of those who are involved with the movements. For example, uh, one of my favorite uh, stories uh, about Guadalupe and the United Farm Workers Movement is that uh, there was not, you know, some, you know, discernment of, you know, oh, how do, you know, what should be our image, right? Uh, it was, you know, one of the women in the movements, you know, asks Cesar Chavez, oh, can I bring my Guadalupe banner? He's like, yeah, sure, bring her, right? And then she becomes this symbol that's deeply associated with this movement. Whereas um, there's this wonderful book by um, one of my mentors, uh, Nancy Pineda Madrid, uh, and it's called um, Suffering and Salvation in Ciudad Juarez. And it's about uh, women in uh, the US-Mexico border uh, regions surrounding uh, uh, Juarez um, who are uh, fighting against uh, what many people uh, uh, 
would know as feminicide or femicide, so the systematic uh, killing of, of women with uh, impunity in the U.S.-Mexico border region. And these women, uh, who, as they started organizing to try to uh, bring um, uh, the church and the government uh, to action, uh, they actively decided not to use Guadalupe as their symbol, in part because of the ways that her image had been leveraged as one of um, uh, you know, trying to promote a certain kind of femininity uh, for Mexican women, a kind of docility, oh, an obedience. Uh, uh, and they didn't think that was amenable to their message. But what they chose instead was to have the names of the women who had been murdered inscribed on the crossbar of a pink cross because they saw that as a way of associating the lives of these women who had been killed with Christ. And so they bring this Christological um, uh, sensibility, but also uh, a devotion to Jesus, <laughs> you know, into their, um, into their movement. Um, but, you know, again, uh, as a, a practical matter, as a means of what's the most eff a politically effective way to, um, uh, to say what we need to say and to, to exert um, uh, the power of our um, organizing in the way that it needs to be exerted. Um, but all of that to say, to get back to um, uh, the quote from Esperanza, uh, just because something is used for a political purpose does not necessarily mean that it doesn't have you know, a deep personal uh, devotion or vice versa. So I think uh, that the, um, uh, the way that these movements have uh, employed um, uh, not just uh, Guadalupe or Mary or um, or Juan Diego or uh, or or Jesus, um, uh, you know that that it's not just about uh, you know one or the other, and uh, that way of thinking I, I I think is too limited for the kind of work that um, uh, that even if I you know can speak more broadly to uh, the, the way that our Catholic faith motivates us for participation in public life and in the life of our democracy. Dr. Flores, thank you so much for joining us tonight and for <laughs> sharing this, thank you. For sharing about Guadalupe and again how how she can engage us in different ways, both in terms of politics and in terms of piety, I think that's a good way of relating the two. I invite all of you to take a moment to step into our chapel and just visit the image of Guadalupe if you're not familiar with her and really look at the details. Um, again, this is the season we have a Guadalupe celebration next week along with our Christmas party, so please come join for that as well. And thank you all for joining us tonight. This is our concluding lecture for this semester, but we'll be back again in February with another series. Thank you. Good evening.